Good afternoon. I'm Ilana Stein, Israeli government spokesperson. This is day 157 of the October 7th war. Day 157 that our hostages have suffered the indignity of being trapped in the Hamas terror dungeons. I want to start today with an update on our casualties from, from this war. IDF fatalities since the start of October 7th massacre have unfortunately risen to 589. That is up to since our last briefing. The people of Israel grieve with the family of Major in Reserves Amishar ben David. Amishar was 43 years old and was killed defending his country in the south of Gaza on Friday. He was from Samaria community of Eli. Amishar ben David was the head of the community of Eli's Magen David Adom Ambulance Service team. Sergeant First Class Reserves Michael Gal fell yesterday in the south of Gaza. He was 29 years old, from Jerusalem. Friends from his beloved Hapoel Jerusalem footballer soccer team remembered him for his kindness, huge smile, and heart of gold. Once again, our reserve soldiers form the backbone of our defense forces that have paid the ultimate price in our ongoing effort to defend our people. The IDF and all Israelis share in the terrible grief of their families. We will continue to accompany them at this unbearable time. Our hearts go out to all the families of those soldiers killed in action as well as those who were murdered, taken hostage, and wounded. May their memories be a blessing. Today marks the beginning of the month of Ramadan. I would like to take this opportunity to wish a Ramadan Karim to everyone celebrating here in Israel and around the world. May this holy month bring peace, joy, and happiness to everyone observing the holiday. Inshallah. Israel maintains freedom of worship for all religions everywhere and at every site, especially on the Temple Mount. The sanctity of the Ramadan month will be kept this year as is every year. Entry of worshippers to the Temple Mount will be permitted, similar to the numbers in previous years. Now an update from Kogat, which is coordinates and facilitates humanitarian aid for Gaza. Over the last 24 hours, 225 trucks carrying humanitarian aid were inspected and transferred to Gaza. Of those trucks, 134 trucks carried food. The rest carried water, medical supplies, and shelter equipment. Focusing on northern Gaza, over the last week, more than 120 aid trucks arrived in the north in coordination with the private sector of Gaza. Just a reminder that before the war, just in terms of food, according to the United Nations, there were only 70 food trucks entering Gaza every day, and yesterday there were 225. We are working on bold new ways with the United States and partner countries to prevent a humanitarian crisis, to get aid to civilians who need it, while making sure Hamas, the terror organization, can't steal it. Israel transfers an unrestricted quantity of humanitarian aid following inspection. Israel supports to the plan to build a temporary pier as well as bringing additional aid as part of the maritime corridor from Cyprus to Gaza Strip. There is no limit to the amount of aid that can enter Gaza. Now an operational update from the IDF. The fight against the Hamas October 7th murderers goes on. IDF special forces in Khan Yunis targeted homes which were used for terror. The IDF arrested Hamas operative and located weapons, ammunition, and military equipment. An anti-tank missile was launched at troops. The t this terrorist was precisely monitored, located, and eliminated. In central Gaza, over the past day, IDF troops killed around 15 terrorists in close quarter combat. A terrorist cell was identified and eliminated. Also in the city of Khan Yunis, IDF ground and aerial forces used sniper fire and tanks to strike terrorists in the area. In the northern Gaza Strip, Israeli naval troops directed a helicopter strike against a vessel used by terror organizations. The IDF will continue to operate against all of Hamas battalions throughout the Strip 
And this includes Rafah, Hamas' last stronghold. Whoever tells us not to operate in Rafah is telling us to lose the war. And that will not happen. Moving to the north of Israel, yesterday around 30 launches were crossed from Lebanon into the area of Mount Hermon. No injuries were reported, thank God. IDF struck the forces of fire in Raha el Fuhar. The IDF also struck Kunin in southern Lebanon, from which launches were carried towards the area of Mount Meron throughout yesterday. Also in the north of Israel, the IDF released details of an important exercise providing supplies under fire as part of operational readiness in the northern border area with Lebanon and Syria. In this exercise, logistical supplies were provided by air to forces on the ground. Equipment, water, fuel, and ammunition. All of those ready to be supplied in an emergency scenario. The IDF is ready for future challenges, supplying our forces under fire if necessary. This brings us to the end of today's briefing. I will now take your questions. Thank you. First question uh, from uh, Swedish news uh, outlet Bulletin. On Saturday, the Swedish government uh, announced that they are restarting their funding of UNRWA. Um, have Sweden been in contact with Israel to gather intelligence on Israel's evidence on UNRWA and Israel's assessment of funding? If so, what has been Israel's message? How will the funding of UNRWA affect the ongoing effort to shut down Hamas? And secondly, Sweden um, uh, mentions assurances from UNRWA on auditing and transparency um, as a factor in starting funding again. In your opinion, can UNRWA be trusted? Uh, is UNRWA necessary in order to facilitate aid to the Palestinians? First of all, UNRWA is part of the problem and not part of the solution, as we saw by the many evidence that Israel has submitted to the UN. Uh, I cannot go into exactly what we showed each and every one of our allies, but I can tell you that the fact is, and this was also known globally, and also we showed it in the press, that there are quite, there's at least a dozen terrorists inside UNRWA, and there's evidence to many more. So what we want to say is the decisions by Canada and Sweden to restore funding to UNRWA after having received the intelligence-based information about the organization's employee who participated in the 7th of October massacre and prior to the completion of the work of the investigative bodies and the publication of their finding, I mean, why would you do that if, before you have all of the information? And you, and you were asked, I, uh, you asked me as well about the, the fact that UNRWA said that they are going to be transparent. A place, a government, uh, an organization that has people who participated in a massacre. If they had teachers who taught children that they should be murderers, how can this organization be trusted? So trusting them is, is a huge mistake. And this in a way, is an agreement and it means it gives them support so by doing this Canada and Sweden are supporting UNRWA and are continuing to ignore the involvement of UNRWA employees in terrorist activities. The return to funding UNRWA will not change the fact that the organization is part of the problem and will not be part of the solution in the Gaza Strip in the future. It can't. Israel calls on the governments of Canada and Sweden to stop the funding and not support organizations whose rank include hundreds of members of Hamas terrorist organizations. Thank you. Um, question from David Clement, the News Forum of Canada. A similar question. Uh, Canada announced on Friday that funding to UNRWA will be resumed after being, pa after being paused. Uh, does the PMO have comment on that, and why should the Cana should Canadian taxpayers, uh, uh, and what should they know about the links between UNRWA and Hamas? So I think what the taxpayers should know is that their money is funding terror, as simple as that. And do they want their money to help terrorists build 
tunnels, educate children how to kill and that they should kill, and train them how to do so. Is that the best way for the taxpayers' money to be used? We think that there are much better ways. If you, we want Gaza to have the bright future that it can't, you can't keep on giving the money to an organization that taught hate, facilitated, and was part of a massacre. And it's not just a few. We have evidence of a lot of people, and there's no way that the people who are running this organization did not know this. So that means that there has to be another solution, and the taxpayers' money should be for a better and future for Gaza, which in, does not include UNRWA in any way. Thank you. Question from Lior Soroka at the Washington Post. Any comments regarding the reports that the IDF is investigating the possibility that Marwan Issa, the deputy head of Hamas's military wing, was killed in an Israeli attack? This you should refer to the IDF and they, they might be able to answer you. Question from Hannah Julian at the Jewish Press. Uh, firstly, the Biden administration officials say that they don't anticipate that Israel will expand its military activities in Rafah anytime soon. Has the Israeli government agreed to on holding back the operation in Rafah? The prime minister said that we must have the operation in Rafah. The reason for that is that we still have one quarter of the terror organization and it's still operating. The meaning of that is that these terror organizations can start to, pr to plan the next attack on Israel, the next massacre. We cannot just let them live there and continue to build their terror organization again. So the fact that they're staying in Rafah does not mean that they will have immunity because they're staying there. So they need to be eliminated or they can always surrender and they can bring back the hostages and all this can be done. If actually they cared about the people in Gaza, they would do that. They would give us back the children that are still being held there, the women, the elderly, the men, the young men, and all this could end, they could surrender, but they chose not to. So until they do so, we must fight them and we must eliminate this terror organization so that the massacre will never happen again. Second question from Hannah Julian at the Jewish Press. There are many foreign air force aircraft flying over Gaza to, to airdrop aid. Does this interfere with the Israeli Air Force and its mission capabilities? Does it limit where Israelis can fly and where they can operate? I cannot go into tactics of the Israeli army, but I, I'm pretty sure that these things um, have a way of working out and p things are coordinated. But again, you can ask the IDF if you want. Question from Joel Pollack at Breitbart News. Uh, President Biden said an attack on, on Hamas in Rafah would be a red line. Prime Minister Netanyahu said, whoever tells us not to operate in Rafah is telling us to lose the war. Will Israel cross the red line? As the Prime Minister said, the obligation of the Israeli government is the Israeli citizens and their safety. We cannot let the terror organization Hamas, which raped, burned babies alive with their parents, kidnapped young children, raped in during this October 7th and probably still doing so at this moment in the dungeons, we cannot give them immunity because they're in Rafah. So we have to eliminate, or as I said before, they can also surrender. That is also a very good way to end this war. Hamas can surrender and they can bring us back all our hostages and the war will end and we will not have to enter Rafah. But at this very moment, this is not what they're doing. So we have to go there eliminate them and this is something that all of the Israeli public supports at least most of them and they support this because they know that if they want to feel safe in this country that is the only way to do so so that is why we must do this for our future but also for the future of Gaza the people of Gaza have also suffered under the terror regime they do not have rights of, of people in other places in the world and once they're free from this terror organization they could rebuild Gaza in a way that will have better quality of life, hopefully a better education, and hopefully they will be terror-free for a very, very long time. Uh, thank you. Another question from Joel Pollack at Breitbart News. Uh, Oscar winner Jonathan Glazer said that Israel is exploiting the Holocaust and that he refutes his Jewishness. 
and the Holocaust being used to justify an occupation. What's Israel's response? I am uh, deeply shocked by this comment, I must say. That's why I'm taking a moment to think that we would exploit uh, the Jewish catastrophe that is called the Holocaust, where six million people died in the most awful ways, is despicable. We are not using anything. Hamas showed how it massacred us. And this is what we are fighting against, a massacre, a terror organization that says that it wants to be from the river to the sea, and that means that they want the whole state of Israel to be free of Jews. Does that remind you of somebody saying that a whole area should be free of Jews? That's what they're saying. And for that to happen, they want to kill and murder and slaughter and rape so that this whole area will be free of Jews. So this is the right context to look at what the Holocaust and October 7th, there's some similarities that they have. And other than that, I'm just very sad that there is this person, and I don't even want to refer to him in his, with his own name, that um, would think that. A final question from J.P. Rubin at Breslev uh, Israel Media Group. Um, the second Secretary General of the UN and Nobel Prize winner, uh, Hamas uh, Kjord, uh, solved international conflicts by active diplomatic actions and daily meditation. Is meditation uh, a tool used by the Israeli leadership? I have not asked each of our leaders specifically if they use meditation. Maybe some of them do, do, maybe some of them don't. But I know that whatever they're doing, there needs to also be practical uh, measures that they're taking. And I know that they're taking every practical measure that they can in order for us to have all our hostages back home. And I know that there are a lot of spiritual people in Israel, a different way that they are expressing their spirituality. And I know that a lot of them are praying and meditating for the return of our hostages so that all of them, all 134 of them, will be back home with us so that we can start taking care of them after the awful place that uh, they are at and all the awful things that they have endured. Thank you. That's the last question. Thank you very much.